السلام عليكم السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآل الطاهرين Today is a different theme, inshallah, we're starting. وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ تِينَ Verily, we created insan, we created man, from an extract of clay. ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُطْفَةً فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينٍ Then we assigned it as a drop of, drop of fluid, which can be referring to either sperm or the embryo, in an established, firm place, referring to the womb. Then we created, or we measured, to be more precise, the that embryo into a clot, which is one stage more developed than the embryo, it, the, the embryo acquires a, the shape of a clot, a blood clot. Then we measured the, this, the embryo at the clot phase into a chewed lump. It's the same embryo. These are it's now describing the evolution of the embryo during gestation. Then in one stage of this evolution, the embryo, its appearance is that of a chewed lump. It looks like a chewed lump. Or maybe a chewed uh, piece of gum, for example, something like that. فَخَلَقْنَا الْمَضْغَةَ إِذَامَا and then we measured the chewed lump into bones. فَكَسَوْنَ الْإِذَامَ لَحْمَا Then we clothed, we clothed the bones with flesh. Then finally, ثُمَّ أَنْشَأْنَاهُ خَلْقًا آخَر Then we generated it. We generated it as something else. Khalgan It's something else now. It's a new creation. It's an other creation. Fatabarakallahu Ahsanun Khalagin. And blessed be Allah, the best of the best of creators. Okay. Now here we see that what started as an embryo then evolved into something bigger, into something bigger, mm -hmm. and kept on evolving until something else was generated. When something else is generated here, it means this new generation is substantially different to what it used to be. And before it was something material. The embryo is material. All those phases, it's something material. When it is generated as something else, which is substantially different from something material, it means this new thing has to be something immaterial. And this new generation, this new creation, arose at around four months during gestation. But it has to be immaterial because it's khalqan akhar. It's another creation. This other means it's substantially different to what it was. Before it was something material in those previous preceding phases. But the point is, that from the embryo phase, after fertilization, to the end, 
the identity of this entity is constant. It's the same entity. We don't have two different entities here during this process. It's always the same entity, but this same entity is evolving whilst mate, maintaining its constant identity. What is that constant identity? It's its soul. Now the next question is that, so does the embryo have a soul? And then does that four month fetus have a soul too? Is it the same soul? Yes, it is the same soul. But at birth, onwards, sorry, at conception, at the embryo stage, that soul is, according to the philosophers, it's something material. It's a material soul. Now what they mean by a material soul is that the soul depends on matter, existence-wise, to such an extent that were you to take away or destroy the matter, the soul will vanish. It, it would cease to exist. This soul, existence-wise, depends on matter. Whichever soul depends on matter for it to exist, they call it a material soul or a vegetative soul. It depends on matter, existence-wise. At four months onwards, that soul is an immaterial soul. An immaterial soul means it's something which is independent from matter, existence-wise. I.e., even if its body was to be destroyed, it will still persist existence-wise. Its soul will not cease to exist. But the point is this. A soul which started out as being material, it's now, after four months, material-immaterial. But it's the same soul. It's evolved. The soul has evolved. But it was materials to, to start off with. Then it became immaterial at four months onwards. Now, the soul very loosely is that which is the source of animation. Even plants have it. That which leads to the plants reproducing, growing nutrition is the soul of the plant. And if you destroy the plant, that soul will cease to exist. With the embryo too, it's a material soul. If the embryo was to be destroyed physically, that soul will cease to exist. But the fetus, at four months onwards, there, the soul will continue to exist, even after abortion, for example. And that's why they do have a hereafter, and that's why th there are many Sharia rulings in relation to burial, in relation to those children, because they have a soul which is immaterial. Once one acquires that immaterial soul, one is technically a person. One is more than an organism. One is a person now. And the blood money is a complete blood money. If they were to be killed, for example. In Christianity, they believe that the immaterial soul exists at conception in the embryo. Modern medicine has proved that's wrong. How? When the embryo reach, reaches the four cell stage, what they did in animals was they, they segregated the four parts of the one embryo. It's at the four cell stage, the blastocyst stage of the four cells. But it's one embryo. 
they separated, they segregated, it's possible, until a certain period. They segregated the four cells of the one embryo, they put it in four wombs. The result was four different offspring of that animal. The question arises that if something is, is an immaterial soul, how can something immaterial, which means indivisible, how can that one immaterial soul now be divided into four souls? How is that possible? Because it was one embryo. It's now four embryos, it's four offspring. It's four souls now. How can an immaterial soul be divided? Whereas Islamic philosophers, they said, no, the soul of an embryo, it's material. And when it's material, it's therefore divisible. It's dependent on matter existence-wise. It can be divided into many more. So, this one end in this verse, it's one entity being discussed. That entity is the soul. This soul evolves into more and more complex entities. The same soul evolves more and more. As it evolves, the soul is becoming more and more complex and indicated that the soul is becoming more and more complex with evolution is that more and more functions are seen at each stage of the embryo. It first starts with rudimentary functions, then you see as it's growing, more and more things are emanating and manifesting from it. It means the soul is evolving, it's becoming more complex. Because the soul is the source of animation, it's the source of generating all an entities, all the entities' functions is a result of that soul. The soul is the generator. Now, be it of a plant, of an embryo, of me and you right now, the soul is generating everything. Not matter, core matter. Now, this soul which is generating it's always in unity, in unity with it, what it's generating. So there's a unity between the generator and the generated. The soul is always generating, and that which the soul is generating is in unity with the generator. It's an important principle we'll come to later, Jonah. That unity between the generator, the soul, and the generated or the generations. When I speak of generation, I mean that which is generated from the generator, which is the soul. So, this soul is always evolving. As it's evolving, it's generating more and more things. Until it comes to the four month stage, and now it's an immaterial soul. How do we know it's immaterial? because now immaterial functions are arising. For example, the, the child can conceive of pain, can eventually the child can see things, hear things. All these are perceptions. Perceptions are immaterial. For example, when you think of things mentally, when you dream of things, all these are perceptions. There's nothing material, there's nothing physical with respect to perceptions. Perceptions are immaterial. At four months onwards, perceptions start, albeit rudimentary. It starts. The child escapes from pain. This has been proven in medical science. It escapes pain. Pain is a perception. It's immaterial. So when we see that now, at a given stage of the fetus, the child is exhibiting and manifesting perceptions, 
which are generations of the generator, it shows that the generator is an immaterial thing, which is now generating immaterial perceptions. So what started as a material soul with materialistic functions, it's now an immaterial soul with, it still has those materialistic functions. In addition to that, this immaterial soul has immaterial manifestations. When does this happen? It's around the four month stage. Then we generated it, that which was a, you know, a simple embryo, we generated it at this stage, after all those stages, we generated as a, another creation. This another is very key, it's a very key term. But when it says another creation, it means it's something substantially different to what it was. What was it before? It was something material. So what is this another? It has to be something immaterial. That's one point. Another point is, this four months that the scholars have said, it's a rough guide. The main criteria as to when an immaterial soul arises in that evolution of the fetus, rather than saying that an immaterial soul came from outside into the womb. First of all, an immaterial soul, what do you mean it came from outside into the womb? It's immaterial. It doesn't travel from a physical place to another physical place. And second of all, how can a something immaterial come into contact with something material? So we have two mutually exclusive things. One is material, one is immaterial. How can you maintain the manner of interaction between two mutually exclusive things. You can't. How can you? There's no way to describe it. And no one has succeeded in explaining it. What Mondo Santo did when he was explaining the interaction between body and soul, he said, look, the embryo is something material. But this embryo evolves. And this very material embryo itself evolves and evolves until it becomes a material dash a material entity. But nothing came from outside. It's always been the same entity. Nothing has come from outside. It just it's, it's evolved. That's it. And that's the most perfect theory to date. But we may get better theories in the future. Now, when we say four months, it's only a rough guide. 1,400 years ago, there was no technology to ascertain exactly when the immaterial soul arises. Today, though, it's possible. How? The Fogaho have it in their books of fiqh. They say that the criteria of when someone becomes a person with that immaterial soul and therefore their blood money is just like anyone else, the criterion is when they have volitional movement. They move voluntarily, not by gravity or reflex. It's a voluntary movement they have. If by, let's say, uh, sonographic technology or other forms of technology, it becomes proven that this movement of the child in the womb is voluntary. Once that is established, there's a person in the womb. And, uh, and you know, that is just like any other person. And their blood money will be just like any other person. The criterion is voluntary movement. But if that's not established, or one is not after exactly when that is, four months is the red line in the Sharia. So even if the movement isn't established but four months has arisen, four lunar months has arisen, then from then on you're dealing with a person. Okay, that was another issue to mention. But the important point is that the identity is the same throughout and that is a soul. But that soul evolves. 
It's always a soul. But it used to be a material soul, then it becomes an immaterial soul. Okay. And then after the verses Thumma and Sha'na or Khalgan Akhar, it's only after saying this Khalgan Akhar, then the verse is Fatabara Kalla or Ahsan al Khalari. Because now this is the best of creations. With the coming of the soul, this is the best and he is the best of creators. Okay. Now, the next point is that in the verse when it says Thumma and Sha'na wa Khalan Akhar, that we 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 generated it as another creation, because Allah is the generator. And Sha'na means Allah is the Munshi, the generator. Now who now Allah works through the worldly causes in this world, in the physical realm of existence, who is the generator? Who is manifesting Allah's generating attribute of being a monshe? In this physical world, who is a manifestation of this generator? Who is manifesting Allah's generating capacity in this world? If we find the answer to this question, we know who is the mother and who is the father. Okay, now, um, Ayatollah Hassan Zawda only has a piece where, in one of his books, where he says, God breathes the spirit now in brackets generates the soul at the four month stage he breathes the spirit in brackets generates the soul by means of God breathes the spirit by means of the channels of existence of the parents God breathes the spirit the Arabic for breathing is nafakha. God is nafakh, the breather of the spirit. But he does this breathing. It's not that God is a, don't say that God is a spirit, and that spirit is breathing something from it, and then that breath separates from it. That's a very worldly understanding of God. It's nothing to do with God being a spirit and then God giving a breath and the breath separating from God, God becoming less, that, that's very problematic. This when God is breathing, He's generating through the parents. It is as if all three, God, Mother and Father, are breathers, are nafikh of the Spirit. But God is the ultimate cause, the independent cause. The others are just manifestations of that breathing capacity of Allah. And this spirit which results will be imprinted, will be influenced based upon these channels of existence of the parents. Like rainwater that enters tributaries. When rainwater enters the tributaries, it gets Mixed up with the tributaries, it may change its color, its odor, and other attributes, depending on what, how the tributaries are. It, it's influenced, it's imprinted by the tributaries, the rainwater. water. The spirit, too, is imprinted by the parents. If the parent is a sinner, it has one effect on the soul. If the parent is a good person, it has another effect on the soul. Let alone all the physical genetics, and so on and so forth. But God breathes the spirit in this world through the parents. So in this world, the nafir, the breather of the spirit, are the parents. So, who is the monshe, the generator? If we find the answer to that question, we'll know who the mother is and who the father is. And that's what we want to find out. Now, who is the father? 
Now here we sometimes have a fiqhi discussion of who the father is. Sometimes we have an Irfani discussion of who the father is. Sometimes there's an overlap, a common ground between the Fuqaha and the Urafa. And that's very good. It's very suitable. And I will be speaking about that overlap, where they're both saying the same thing. However, each of you have to follow your marriage here on who is the father and who is the mother. Some of your marriage may be saying what the Orafa are saying. Some of your marriage may not be saying it. That's a fiqhi discussion separate. You follow your marriage. Also here I'll be entering the fiqhi discussion too. And I'll be reading one or two fatwas from the present marriage. And I'll be reading that line which is on a par with what the Orafa say, who the father is, who the mother is. Is the father the owner, the possessor of the sperm, period? Or is being a father something else? In the West, they've broken the boundaries of different sciences. You have to, you have to clearly, clearly clarify. We have different sciences. Each science has to be demarcated from the other. You can't just say a father is that man who shows affect affection, for example, to the child. He is the true father. We don't have that. He's a very good man to foster this child. He's a very decent man. He's a very heavenly man. He's a very righteous man, whatever you want to say. But don't say father. Father has a clear definition. Don't get excited all of a sudden. But when you do that, you're, you're mi messing up, mixing up different, different sciences together. It's going to cause problems. <coughs> we want to know who is the father. The answer is who is the generator? Who is a manifest manifestation of Allah's attribute, mon -sheh. It's this attribute, mon -sheh. We want to know who is manifesting it in this world. It's the father who is the monshe. But who is the father? Is it only having been an owner of the sperm? You see, in IVF, where the sperm of the man and the egg of the woman are put in a test tube for fusion and fertilization to occur in the test tube, for the embryo to actualize in the test tube, for a test tube baby to arise, here, all the man did was give a sperm sample. Or for example, in ICSI, which is uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, ICSI, what happens is they pick, they choose, they extract one sperm, one spermatozoan, and they inject that one sperm, they inject it into the female egg. Now here, all the man did was give a sample of sperm. So in IVF, in ICSI, and in other um, technologies, the question arises, when the man only gave a sperm sample, did the man generate anything actively? Is the man a monsieur? How has the man in IVF and in ICSI and other technologies, how has the man acted as a generator? He hasn't. Whereas if copulation arises with copulation, with intercourse, there, with copulation, accompanied with seminal emission, there, generation does qualify. The man is actively generating. But before, that's not happening. If you just give a sperm sample, there's a difference here. With copulation, the man is actively generating. And therefore, some of the Fogahar 
have said, to be a father, you have to. Both copulation and emission has to arise. And they, many for who don't accept, with IVF, they don't accept that man who gave the sperm sample as the father. Why don't they accept? They base it on certain traditions, but the ultimate reasoning, the ratio league is behind it, is because they are not generating. It's with copulation that the man is being a one ship. Without copulation, there's no active generation. Generation. It's passive. Or when the doctor is injecting, for example, that spermatozoan, where's the active uh, generating here? Or are you going to see the doctor who's doing the injection, he is generating it? For the man to qualify as a generator, copulation has to arise actively. If that arises and the offspring arises, that offspring, that will be the father. I'll come to the one or two fatwas in a minute, but the majority say the owner of the sperm alone will suffice. So if your manager, for example, said that, don't panic. Yes. Now, there's a verse in the Holy Quran, Ayyah sabul insano ayyutraka soda. Does man think that we're going to just neglect him, abandon him? Alam yako nutfatam min maniyin yomna. Weren't you a drop of fluid, referring to sperm? That was transmitted, yomna. Weren't you a drop of fluid that was transmitted? Look. Who is the transmitter? Weren't you a drop of fluid that was transmitted, yomna? Yomna comes from the gerund, imna. Imna means a transmission of sperm from a place to another place. So who is the transmitter of the sperm from one place to another place? It's the man who copulates in procreation. Only with copulation, that movement of sperm, that transmission of sperm from place to place, occurs actively by the man. He's doing it actively. And that leads to the procreation of the offspring. But at this point, inshallah, I'll cover it tomorrow. There was another thing I wanted to mention, but that, inshallah, I'll mention tomorrow because time is running by. But who is the transmitter? You were a drop of fluid, it was transmitted. Let's find the transmitter. It was Allah, of course. But in the worldly realm, who is manifesting this transmitting capacity of Allah? It's the father. It's the mother too, but I'll explain that tomorrow. And he only can transmit the sperm through copulation actively. Now in IVF, in XC and other technologies, that active transmission is not happening. It's passive. It's not happening. Many of the Fuqaha, have regarded this as crucial in determining who the father is. And they say copulation is a prerequisite to being a father in the procreation of the offspring. Now look, spermatologists today, I was at a conference in Scotland a few months ago, it was a very recent the new findings in spermatology and embryology they were given. And there, there was a spermatologist who said all this time we were studying the sperm, studying it to see which sperm have the capacity to get to the egg. So we're studying different sperm to see what is it in them 
which leads many of them, not all, out of 300 million, why do only 100 get near the egg to the fallopian tube out of 300 million? And then out of those 100 sperm cells, why does only one get to the egg, usually? So we were studying the sperms to see, to get an idea. So in IVF or in ICSI, we choose the strong spermatozoa. Because in ICSI, we choose one sperm to inject. In IVF, it's only a part of the sperm which is are used. It's not the whole 300 million, for example. If we get to know and identify the strong sperm which get to the end, then for ICSI we can choose that strong sperm, or for in IVF. But now we've realized, he said, that we were going the wrong way. The egg is sending signals for one sperm to eventually get to it. We have to study the egg in detail. The egg is sending the signals for that one sperm out of 300 million to eventually get to it. So if only one sperm gets to it, if only one sperm gets to it, in ICSI, and that sperm is, the egg is giving the signs for that one sperm to get to it. One in, out of 300 million. In ICSI, we're choosing the sperm. For us to choose the right sperm, it's one in 300 million. That's not good odds. Maybe that wasn't a sperm which was on a par with that egg. We're forcing a sperm into the egg and creating an offspring which that egg signals never wanted. I'm not sure whether I succeeded to highlight the problem here. But IVF and ICSI has these problems. The egg is doing the signaling, and it signals only one sperm. You just picked on the sperm and you're forcing it into this egg. It may cause problems, it may not. But there's no difficulty here. It's not haram, don't get me wrong. ICSI, IVF, it's all allowed, don't worry, don't panic, everything okay. But when you go, you know, spiritually, when you look at it, you're forcing the wrong sperm. It's like an arranged marriage, for example. <laughs> you know, it's arranged marriages. By arranged marriage, I mean forced marriages. That, well, the, the woman doesn't want the man. But she's forced with this man. Something, something like that is happening. Rather than the woman giving signals to that right man for that marriage to happen. Okay. There are many points, but you know, I don't want to rush this. We'll go through it slowly. Inshallah, we'll continue with this tomorrow.